I think we have to always be clear that repression and colonialization will always lead to resistance. It's inevitable that the Palestinian people would resist what was happening to them. Already this year before the Hamas attack, 280 plus Palestinians have been killed at the hands of the Israelis. Day and daily they're under siege, living in horrendous conditions even at the best of times. So I think it's inevitable that there's going to be resistance. And while it's always regrettable to hear of innocent lives being lost, I think I've got to keep the whole thing in context. And the situation facing the people of Gaza at the moment is appalling. It's absolutely appalling. So. Our solidarity has to go to the battled Palestinian people and their struggle with the Israeli oppressors. Well, there's a number of reasons, I suppose. One is the history of Ireland, where we've had a long history of resistance to British colonialism, British imperialism. So it was conditions on the, at the time on the day, actually, that led me to take the immediate decision. It was tempered by the fact that there had been a long history in Ireland of which I was aware. And of course then at the time there was the horrendous events of 1970. The repression that had been met with peaceful democratic resistance had been lethally attacked by forces of the state and their supporters. So in many ways it was defensive action, but I think what propelled me into taking the decision was the internment without trial, which was launched in August of 1971. Well, of course, there was the wider political conditions and context in which we take the recent decision. I think immediately we have to consider the fact that on arrest, had been, I had been brutally treated, tortured effectively by the Royal House to Constabulary, an experience which many of my colleagues and comrades in the prison had experienced. Very brutal treatment in order to force enforced confessions from people. Then there was, of course, the fact that we were tried before a non-jury diplock court, which meant that the chances of acquittal were practically nil. And on the basis of a simple verbal statement, which I always contested that I had ever made, I was sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, this wasn't a unique experience to me. Others had experienced the same type of treatment. And then when committed to the prison, we met with very brutal treatment by the prison regime. So. And that was all taken into consideration and the fact that we felt it was imperative to break the deadlock, if you like. We have been there for a number of years as it seemed to be stretching indefinitely into the future we had to take a decision. And we couldn't indefinitely endure the horrendous conditions we were being imposed upon us, so we did decide to take the decision to go on hunger strike. Well, to be honest, we expected to have support in Ireland, a little support possibly from the States and from our colleagues and supporters in Britain, and though not so many in Britain. But we did, and I didn't anticipate the, if you like, global impact that a hunger strike in Ireland would have. Certainly, it, it transformed the Irish struggle from one of probably localised struggle into an internationalised struggle. I have to keep in mind that while the 1980 hunger which I was on had very significant support, made a huge impact at the same time. The 1981 hunger strike led by Bobby Sands had a global impact. It was brought to the attention of countries as far apart as Cuba, Iran, Soviet Union at the time, and also I think, which was also a factor, that it reawakened in the old parts of, parts of the old British Empire the realisation that Britain hadn't really changed for that reason. Support was expressed in the Indian Parliament in Benaya, Hong Kong, across Africa. It's well noted that Nelson Mandela himself in his cell noted the fact that on the 5th of May, Bobby Sands had passed away. So it internationalised the struggle in a way that was unanticipated by myself and many others. But it also had an impact of energising huge numbers of particularly young people, men and young men and young women in Ireland, which really challenged the narrative of the British at the time that, that the Irish struggle was a small group of criminal terrorists, as they liked to call us, without any support. And that we were isolated, a handful of small areas in the north of Ireland. But the hunger strike demonstrated that we had support right across the island, we had support continental Europe and across the world and that's really changed the analysis, changed the narrative and I believe it changed the uh, 
the British assessment of what was happening there, possibly not in public, but the deep state that really has to analyze the situation as it is rather than how they wish it to be, how to take the decision. But it was no longer possible just to treat it as a security issue, and I think that led to a massive change. Personal level, he was very affable. He was incredibly energetic. I think that's the thing that strikes me, which struck me most. I remember, remember best about Bobby Sands. He was incredibly energetic. Now, keep in mind that we were confined to cell 24 hours a day. We never really could get out of the cell because of the conditions we were in, that we were locked in the cell 24 hours a day. But all the time, Bobby was talking. He was preparing. He was talking uh, from the, through the door to the rest of the wing. He was organizing Irish language classes. He was organizing history classes he was organising, believe it or not he was organising singing lessons for different people, singing in English and singing in Irish. But he was always, always energetic, he was always planning, he was always talking, he was always organising debates and of course he had a great sense of humour as well. So a personality, and a huge personality and a very of course likeable person as well. It really began in the aftermath of the hunger strikes for me because my analysis was that Sinn Féin were moving to an exclusively electoral position which I thought was a mistake and on the basis of an electoral position what we might now, now call triangulation. Initially they were talking about the nationalist population which was something that I found risky on the basis that nationalism is, 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 can be a very often a very dangerous even a certain kind of productive philosophy. I believed in republicanism, I believed in socialism, but not nationalism. I thought that they were attempting to broaden the base and by triangulation want to lower their objective away from the socialist republic towards something significantly less. And I've had no reason to change my mind in the years since. But having said that, of course, I could understand what they were talking about, understand how they were effectively seduced along the road. But that was my critique of the, of the Sinn Féin party and it's in the provisional area that it was accepting. If you like, what we would call totally the Blairite type triangulation, diluting its commitment to a socialist republic rather than maintaining a demand for a different economic system as well as constitutional arrangement. Well, Paradoxically, in spite of what I've said, I believe that it has went a considerable distance to undermining the, the Unionist position within the six counties of Northern Ireland. It's also alerted the Republic of Ireland that the Conservative elements in the Republic of Ireland that things were in the constitutional situation will not remain indefinitely. Demographics are changing in the North as well. So, to that extent, it has had an impact. Now, my concern is that the Sinn Féin party would settle for what we call the United Ireland, which is simply a removal of partition, but not fundamentally alter the economic situation, the economic system. I still am convinced, convinced socialist. I believe that I have to take into the hands of the working class the means of production, distribution, and exchange. I don't believe that there should be a market-led economy. And that's something that is not guaranteed if we just simply settle for what's known as the United Ireland. I think we've got to work and keep this in view on the radar. The Workers' Republic and the Socialist Republic that James Connolly fought and died for. Well, I have a huge empathy for anybody on hunger strike, particularly our brothers and sisters in Palestine who yeah, empathise and sympathise and endorse their demands for justice and the return of, of their homeland. But hunger striking, in my opinion, is has often been defined as the last option for a prisoner. And it is the last option a prisoner, so the last card a prisoner can play. And on that basis, we have often certainly salute the courage of Palestinians who mark on hunger strike and sympathise with them in so many, many, many ways, just wish to witness that they didn't feel that necessary, they didn't have to embark on that course of action, but while they do, all I can say is support and call for support from them. Well, there's very little difference. The media is either owned by the state or by incredibly wealthy individuals, and there's little difference in their outlook. They are basically imperialist, pro-imperialist, 
and I take the view that any challenge to the establishment, any challenge to imperialism, to the imperial power, is a threat to their self-interest. So it's been described as terrorists in Ireland, but we were described as terrorists. It's a term that is used to describe Palestinians instead of people fighting for freedom, for justice, and for what they're entitled to. The media has a filter, pro-imperialist filter. That's the media, certainly in the West. Now, there are other medias that are much better, but uh, certainly the Western media, Britain, Ireland, and the States, continental Europe for the most part, is pro-imperialist. It, it supported the status quo, which was imperialism in my, my time in the struggle in Ireland, and it's the same pro-imperialist position as today as they're defining the, the, their narratives they're creating around the Palestinian struggle. Also, a clear understanding of what's happening in Palestine. Because the same, effectively, the same process happened here in Ireland several centuries ago when we were colonised by the British. And there's a term that I don't use when I'm talking about the Israeli occupation. I don't talk about settlers, I talk about planters. In the future, if you're aware of Irish history, it was a plantation of Ireland, a plantation of Ulster. So land was taken, people were driven into the wilderness, kept in subjection by brute force. And I really understand that so the similarities, the parallels between what's happening to the Palestinians and what's happened since the Nakba in 1948 is so reminiscent of what happened in Ireland through the 17th and 18th century. So for that reason, I know we identify very clearly and we empathise, particularly with the plight of the Palestinian people today.